All right, so uh, we're going to talk a little about different things. We'll start at Proverbs 1. I think I, 1 through 9. So on Friday, we discussed that Proverbs has two meanings. One, you know, Proverbs means like riddle, you know, uh, uh, parable. And the other meaning is reigning in life. So Proverbs teaches us, you know, secrets of the kingdom on how to reign in life. And it was written by Solomon. And when you read the Bible, when you read Proverbs, you are being imparted, okay? When you watch movies and you listen to music, you are being imparted of a certain spirit. And so you have to be very careful because... If your faith is weak, you're going to be influenced by those spirits, right? And, like, and I said on Friday, it's not, you know, we live in a pagan world, okay? You shouldn't be surprised when all these things are happening in the world regarding gender, abortion, and, and all that other nonsense because we live in a pagan world, okay? And so... But our job, of course, is to uh, be a city shining on the hill, right? That's, you're supposed to be salt and light. King David represents war, warring with the enemy. And then after obtaining victory, King Solomon represents peace, reigning in life. Now, he made some mistakes, yes, but... Besides that, the context and the point that we need to understand is that when you come to Christ, you will have a season, a long season perhaps, of just warring in the Spirit. And going to war, of course, in the Spirit is, you know, praying, reading, coming to church, fellowshipping, dying to yourself, learning to submit to authority, and all the above. Amen? And then... If you get to that place of victory, then you'll have a blessed life rather than a constant life of just fighting demons all the time, right? Having not enough, just your minimum, always chasing and never catching up, right? So a lot of Christians experience this through their lives. They know, they, they may know, they may know the promises of the Bible, and they know some slogans, but they're not actually living that promised life. And they're not being wise. Why? Because if something's not working, you got to fix it. Amen? Instead of just accepting that their life is handicapped and just blaming the devil for the rest of their life, when you have the authority over the devil and you can live a victorious life because that's why he died for you. He didn't die for you so you can live a mediocre life. He didn't die for you so you can live a, uh, you know, a minimum catching up, never getting ahead life. He didn't, give, he didn't die so you can just live like that. He lived and he died to save us. And he went to the cross so that we can do greater things than even he did. Because that's what the Bible says. And when you, as parents, you are also living so that you're setting up for your children to live and do greater things than even the parents did, right? That's what you want. You want the children to, to have experience and have a blessed life than even maybe what you've gone through. And if you suffered, you know, you, you don't want your parent, children to suffer like you, right? You want them to live a good life. And so Jesus, Father God, has the same mindset, right? He wants all of us to live that life that God had originally created for all of us. Amen? 
But we got to get out of our, you know, nonsense, okay? And so uh, I'll do the illustration with the Ziploc bags in a little bit. But let me read Proverbs here. Proverbs mean reigning in life, okay? So you have to read Proverbs to at least get a concept and the foundation of, you know, how it's going to help you reign in life because it's going to tell you things not to do and some things you should do. And so the wisest man who walked the earth, besides Jesus, of course, because Jesus is wisdom, and he imparted that into King Solomon. And King Solomon, being the wise man to have walked this earth, has written something for us. And if you fail to read this, I mean, then your shortcoming is on you. Because it's, it, many blood was spilled f- so that we can have this freedom. That you can sit here in freedom. Many other Christians have sacrificed their life. Jesus went through the cross for this. And so... You should, out of appreciation, know the Word of God. Amen? Okay. Um, Oh, can we go to chapter 1, please? All right. Here are kingdom revelations. So Proverbs consist of kingdom revelations. Words to live by. It's your manual, all right? And words of wisdom given to empower you to reign in life. Amen? Written as Proverbs by Israel's King Solomon, David's son. Within these sayings will be found the revelation of wisdom and the impartation of spiritual understanding. In First Kings, King Solomon, when he asks for wisdom, is asking for understanding okay and so he's now imparting that through the book of proverbs and other writings to god's people down the generations and so when you read and when you accept with an open heart not only are you learning knowledge but you will be imparted the spiritual understanding amen use them to as keys right to unlock the treasures of true knowledge. Those who cling to these words will receive discipline. All right, so discipline is part of life. Discipline will teach you right and wrong. Discipline will teach you don't touch, touch that. You can do that, you can't do that. It's part of life. And if you don't like discipline, the Bible says you're a fool. And you don't love life. That's what the Bible says. So you have to actually embrace discipline. I want to learn. I want to be corrected. I need to do the right thing, right? I need to walk in truth. That should be your posture, and that should be your attitude. It shouldn't be, oh, I don't want to be disciplined. I don't want my weakness exposed. I don't want to be in the spotlight. That's the wrong attitude. You're basically saying, I love darkness more. That's what you're saying. We'll receive discipline to demonstrate wisdom in every relationship and to choose what is right and just and fair. So a mature Christian is mature, and if you, and if you realize that they're mature, then you will realize that they've been disciplined by God. You will realize they've also suffered for God, and it will be demonstrating that they've learned wisdom. Amen? In every relationship. And they know how to choose right and wrong in most respect. These proverbs will give you great skill to teach the immature and make them wise. All right? So the immature should read this ten times. Minimum. To give youth the understanding of of their design and destiny. For the wise, these proverbs will make you even wiser And for those with discernment, you will be able to acquire brilliant strategies for leadership. So if you want to be a leader, you definitely need to read Proverbs. These kingdom revelations will break open your understanding to unveil the deeper meaning of parables, poetic poetic riddles, and epigrams, and to unravel the words and enigmas of the wise. 
So we're reading the uh, Passion Version of chapter 1. We cross the threshold of true knowledge when we live in obedient devotion to God. Your mind opens up when we live in obedience to God. Devotion, okay, full devotion. This is why some of our minds are cloudy, all right? And you got fog eyes, fog brain, how they call it, right? Because we're not living in full obedience to God. We're living in partial obedience to God. And when your mind is foggy, then you got to realize is, you know, you need to, I, oh, I need to, li- I, there's some areas that I, I'm not obeying, so I need to do this. You got to think, amen? Stubborn know-it-alls will never stop to do this, for they scorn true wisdom and knowledge. Pay close attention, my child, to your father's wise words, and never forget your mother's instruction. Father represents Father God. Father represents authority. Mother, your mama, represents the church. Mother can also represent the church, all right? And mother can represent your biological mother, your spiritual mother, but also as in the church, the, the helpers of the church that, can, that leads you, that guides you, that um, mentors you is also part of the motherhood, if you will. For their insight will bring you success. So if you want success, these are the instructions. Adorning you with grace-filled thoughts and giving you reins to guide your decisions. Amen? All right, next one, please. Uh, Proverbs. Yeah, Proverbs 4, 1 through 4. Listen to my corrections, my sons. So, you know, King Solomon is speaking, writing to his sons. Because, you know, he had like, what do we have, 300 wives? So he had a lot of sons. This, this don't mean you can go get more than one wife. My sons, for I speak to you as your father, let discernment into your heart and you will grow wise with the understanding I impart. My revelation truth is a gift to you, so remain faithful to my instruction. For I too was once delight of my father and cherished by my mother, their beloved child. Then my father taught me, saying, Never forget my words. If you do everything I teach you, you will reign in life. Okay? So that's the kind of theme of the message, reigning in life. And the Lord Jesus came and said, I've come to give you abundant life. Okay? Not a mediocre life. Not a life of struggling. Not a life of being a bottom feeder or the tail. Right? Not, not a life of being a catfish or a carp. That's what a carp does. Big old eyes. Okay? He came to give us a life where you are the head. You are, you are reigning in life. That we are the leaders. We are, we are the answer to the world. Because Christ in us. The hope of glory. And many of us may start out as a jarhead. Okay, and that's, that could also be by design. But it doesn't mean that you're going to stay a jarhead, okay? Because the wisdom, the supernatural wisdom is going to be imparted to you. But you have to get to the basics, right? The basics is what? As a Christian, if you're a Christian, you should know the Word of God. You should, on your own, Read it, and you know we con- continuously emphasize this until your brain hurts. Right? Read the word, pray, and you got to come to service, fellowshipping with the brothers and sisters. You have to learn spiritual authority. You have to understand kingdom principle. All right, because most of us come conform from the world as the world, and you have to be made new. Because the old is not going to work. And so the old is trying to enter the new and it's colliding. All right? So you have to become new. Amen? In order to reign in life. As I said earlier, David was a man of war. 
And he's like, I'm going to build a temple, but God says, no, you have too much blood on your hand, and so your son Solomon will build the temple. And so we have two phases, all right? And so, like I said, you may be in a season of war, and that could be a long time. As APC mentioned yesterday, Joshua, the book of Joshua, he fought, conquered about 31 kings in the promised land. So when you enter the promised land, you're going to war, okay? You're coming out of Egypt, you're going through the wilderness so that you can build some faith, really. Faith in God, and now you are stepping into war to take the land. Do you understand this? You have to take the land back from the enemy, from the demonic realm, because right now, the demonic realm and the principalities have your wealth, have your health, have your kids, have your marriages, have your, you know, your careers, your business, uh, blocking you and, and you being a jarhead. They, they're doing this to you, us. And so entering the promised land is by grace, and he's going to... He wants to send us into the promised land, but now you got to choose to fight in the promised land. And those 31 kings, you can look at it as representing 31 principalities or dominions that you need to take back so you can get your health back, you can get your marriage back, you can get your kids back, you can get your money back, you can get everything back. Okay? That's the promised land. And then when we take it all back, let's go to 1 Kings 5, I think it is, right? Did I give you 5? But now the Lord my God has given me rest from war on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune confronting me. Who's the adversary? The devil. There is a place where the devil can't touch you no more. Right? Where you're now like living in peace and prosperity because you've already warred. You've taken the land back. Okay, you've taken the land back. Your faith is up there. You're, 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 you're posturing. You're living as the bride of Christ. Knowing that you have received and you're exercising your authority. There's order in your family. Order in your life. And everything you touch now turns to platinum, gold, or whatever, whatever is valuable to you. And, there's, and you don't have to blame the devil anymore. Like the little kids do. Ah, oh, the devil did it. The devil's out there, but he can't touch you. You're too high on the hill. The light, city of light on the hill. You're too high. They can't touch you no more. And when you're up there on the hill, you're shining. You know, like you know, some of these houses on the mountains, you're like looking up the mountain. You go, that's a nice house. I wish I had that house. That's a big house, in fact. I wish I lived. You know, that's how I'm just, you know, how people think. And so being the light spiritually, now spiritually being the light on the hill, a city, people are drawn to do. That's Spanish for you. They're supposed to be drawn to you. They're supposed to be drawn to us. Why? Because Christ in us, the hope of glory, is shining on top of the hill, high enough where demons can't even touch you anymore. And, and you're living as, as we're supposed to. Kingdom, priests, royalty, God's sons and daughters, God's kings and queens, prince and princes. But instead of acting like trying to live like that here in the sewer of life, get out of the sewer first. Right? Don't play, you know, castle in the sewer. Being too prideful, perhaps. Clean the sewer. Clean your toilet first. Okay? Learn to clean your toilet first. 
And so we want to get to this place. Amen. So how do we get to this place? God is very, very, he's very graceful, we all know. He's also very methodical and he's very strategic. And unless you understand his ways, you're just going to get mad. Okay? You're going to get mad. You're going to throw a tantrum. You're going to pout. And you're just going, why not? Why God? Why are you doing this to me, God? Why aren't you answering my prayer? Why aren't you blah, blah? That's what you're going to do. Because you don't understand his ways. And you don't even realize that even what looks bad, God is trying to actually set you up for a blessing. But in order for you to be blessed, send me to Jeremiah, please. Jeremiah 17, 9, 10. I hope we all know this, right? The heart, the human heart, is deceitful above all. All things. And it is extremely sick. Who can understand it fully and know its secret motives? I, the Lord, search and examine the mind. I test the heart to give each man according to his ways, according to the result of his or her deeds. So, the world has a saying. And they say, oh, I'm going to trust my heart. As Christians, you should never trust your heart. Because your heart is above all things most deceitful and extremely sick. Okay? It's puking. So if you trust your heart, you're going to get deceived, right? People say, oh, I, I love this guy. I love this woman. I'm going to go by what my heart says. And then you, you know what happens after that, right? So you can't trust your heart. You got to get rid of your heart. You have to trust God, not your heart. And so we have to ask God, God, I need a new heart. That's why it says in the Bible in Ezekiel, I'll give you a new heart and a spirit. But God's not going to give you a, a new heart like, 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 okay, one for one. I'll give you a new heart. I'll take your extremely sick one. It doesn't do that. Then you're just a robot. So through your life... Some sooner than later, I guess. You have to choose to have his heart. So when you deal with people, when you deal with things in life, if you want God's heart and you want a heart that loves people, then in that moment of your testing or circumstance, you have to, based on what you learn from the word and through God, you have to choose his choice. Die to yourself, forgive, and then in that area of your heart, it changes. So you can have all this your own wicked heart, and there's a little God's heart working now. And then through, and then you just keep working. And then eventually, you're going to have all of his heart. And then you'll act more like him. While other people, see, it's like you, you get saved, and you get a deposit of the Holy Spirit, right? Deposit. So you have a deposit, but you got to get the full payment. Okay, you need the whole, you need all of the Holy Spirit so that you can be filling and overflowing. Amen? So don't trust your heart, okay, in case you didn't know. Now, let's say this is your heart. This is the old and this is all it can contain, all right? This is what it can contain. And as God's people, because we hear, oh, God wants to bless us, and you want to be blessed, right? You want to be blessed. You want to get out of your one-bedroom rental, and you want God to give you your own house, right? You want, you want to get out of the lemon car, and you want a brand-new car. You want to get out of the retail hourly job and you want to make good salary and benefits right you want stocks you want you want to you know you want to live the abundant life you want a good spouse if you're not married you want a good husband that'll take care of you you want a good wife that will 
keep the family together, a, prayer, a woman of prayer, a woman that makes the right decision at the right times. You want a man who's going to be protective, right? a husband, a man who's going to be a man, a father, a husband, one who gets up and goes to work. You want a wife who can cook, I hope, hmm? unless you want to cook yourself, I guess, ramen or water. You want a wife who can clean your house, take care of the kids, right? So we all have expectations of one another, right? And you have your idea spouse, idea husband, idea life. And you're like, God, I want to be blessed. And so we hear these words, you know, people like, you know, God's going to bless you. So you want this huge blessing, let's say. But your heart. Is this small? It's old, green, it's sick, it's vomit. So you need a bigger heart. Now I would have got a garbage bag, but I don't, it's only black. I forgot to bring the clear 33 gallon garbage bag. Okay, so imagine this as a 33 gallon, you know, one of those big garbage bags. You want that type of heart to contain the blessing you're asking for. Okay, you want this type of blessing, but your heart, okay, is this small. But in order to get the big blessing, your heart, okay, must become big enough to uh, receive, receive and, and hold, sustain, your blessing. Amen. So God has a strategy because a lot of times we just do things backwards. But he's very graceful. What God does is he likes to get leverage on us. You know what that means? Leverage? If he gives you title first in this church, like, you know, uh, head deacon or shanti like God may be head deacon and I don't even know what that means which is true you know we have elders when they became elders they like even elder Sam's like I don't know I don't know so like yesterday when we were praying we had deliverance sessions and youth pastor was getting delivered elder Sarah called the elders and I was thinking Oh, this is a good idea. Let me have them put their forth their hand and let the demons follow them home. And I'll just go back. You guys get good sleep? <laughs> just be careful for the rest of the week, okay? <laughs> but, you know, as a spiritual church, you have to be ready for that, all right? Demons jump in everywhere. And, and they're going to go after the leaders first. And how they go after you is they try to make the wives and the husbands fight first, right? And, you know, Proverbs says that hate causes strife. Love covers a multitude of sin. If you're walking in love, you're going to... Be more prone to give grace and just let it go. If you're walking in hate, you're constantly looking for a fight. And you have yet to experience the revelation of God or the, the revelation of his love. And most of God's people are in that category. They fight a lot. You just look at your own marriages, okay? Little cat fights. Hmm? Now... We all start that way, but the qu real question still remains, are you getting better? Is your fight decreasing? And even if you have fights, is it like, are you able to overcome and mend and continue? Or do we find resentment and, and build on top of resentment? Or do we build on top of love and grace and forgiveness? So there's only two paths constantly, right? Only two paths. So... Let's say, for example, God has given you 
position. And elders or, or head deacon or shanti, like, they don't know what that means. So he gives you first. Okay? He may even give you a job first. A really good job. A job that you're like, how did I get this job? It makes, I make the most money ever in my life. And, I, and you're like, yeah, glory to God, I, he gave me this job. Right? So you acknowledge that. Or an event happened, or something happened. Or maybe he, you're, you're, you have the taste of goodness where a spouse is within your reach, a really good spouse. Or maybe a house is within your reach. Spouse, house, rhymes. What's another one? House, spouse, mouse. Maybe a breakthrough in money. Or getting out of debt. Or you're expecting something that can help you. Okay? You're expecting something that can help you. A settlement, perhaps. Okay? Bonus. A, a business. Going to school, being accepted somewhere. Just because you get accepted in college doesn't mean it's over, right? You now got to go through it. You got to finish. So God can put you in this predicament and give you that taste. He can touch your husbands or wives that you've been praying for. and Maybe all of a sudden they decide to come to church. So you get this little taste, right, of goodness, of possibility, of, of, of higher blessings or breakthrough. But there's a squeeze on, okay, if you don't know this pattern. The squeeze is he'll give you that reward first, and the pattern is not always in disorder. He'll give you that reward first. Maybe he's also delivered your spouse or your relative from some addiction. So you're praying, you're reading, you're coming to church, right? And then the squeeze comes on. And what is that squeeze? That squeeze looks like something is deteriorating. It's breaking down. Okay? That what you, what you tasted now is like slipping away. That's a squeeze. And so you may get mad at God or you might start complaining to God. It's like, God, I, I, you know, you might even say, I did this, I did that. And, and, and like now, how come you're not answering my prayer? Or like, God, you said you, you, I pray for this. You're answering it. I saw it. It's in the glim. It's that right there at the, at right there. Uh, it's in my fingers and it's slipping away. What's he want from you? What's the purpose of this squeeze? He's trying to bless you and fill that bag, your heart, okay? He wants to. He wants to give you what you were reaching out for, what you were praying for. But he wants something back from you. The old, the old, in order to get the new... You must become the new. Okay? You have to change in order to experience change. You cannot stay the old man and think you're going to get this great blessing. He'll, he'll give you, he'll let you taste it. And there's people who've lost it. Why? Because you didn't change. You, you could have got something from him. He's giving it to you out of grace, but in order to keep it and to receive, keep on receiving, you got to change. If you got an anger problem, you, you got to get rid of your anger. If you got a lust problem, you better get rid of your lust, okay? If you got a, a, a disobedience problem, you better get rid of this. You cannot stay the old to receive the new. Make sense? 
Okay? But he'll let you taste it. Okay? He'll let you taste is good. This is what it can be. Otherwise, you don't change. It's going to start slipping. You're going to see tears. All right? You're going to see tears like, and that's what, you're going to get worried because you're like, okay, the, the, these safety measures are not, not connecting and deadlines are approaching. Hmm? Deadlines for bills are approaching and, and something is not cooperating. You know, government not cooperating, your money's not cooperating, your boss is not cooperating, you know, things are not cooperating. Why? God's squeezing you. You want it, you better change. You want it, you better repent. Because in order for you to receive the bigger blessing and to reign in life, the old cannot do. The old cannot go into the new wine sack. You, you as a new person or you as with a new blessing, new money, new authority, new happy marriage, happy family, it's not going to work. In the new, if you stay in the old. That's, that's the simple answer. That's, that's, what, that's the answer, people. Okay? You cannot stay the same in this church. You are mandated to change. Every year, let's say I'm a tree. Okay? T-R-E-E. Apple tree. Pear tree, whatever tree. I'm going to look different next year. Right? I'm going to have grown next year. I'm going to look different. I'm going to look bigger. I'm going to have bigger fruit. I'm going to... See, I am bigger so I can bear bigger fruit. I'm bigger so I can provide more shade. And because I've grown and I'm bigger, I am able to produce bigger fruit, bigger leaves. So the tree changes every season. We, people of God, you are mandated to change every season. That's the only way you're going to get the bigger blessing. You want to stay the old man? old woman, I'll just call you old woman, or old man, and you're going to be, you're just, the next year, you're not going to have anything new. It, you'll just be able to keep the old of last year, or you might even start decreasing. Okay? There's no option. You have to grow. You have to to change. You have to continually become new. Every day is a new day. Right? You don't wake up and go, okay, it's Monday again. Okay, it's Monday again. Let's do the same thing. Right? No, we have a new day. Everything is new. Everything is new. And so every day, you got to become new. Okay, something has to change. You either less angry person, less, you know, disobedient person, less anxiety person, less, you know, person living in fear, less, you know, lustful person. You don't Increase in your screen time looking at nonsense. You should be decreasing your screen time looking at the nonsense. This is a war that you will fight for the rest of your lives, perhaps. But hopefully we can get to um, First Kings, right? Where you have peace in all sides. And now it's just living an abundant life. But you have to choose, okay? You have to understand something. You need to choose. I can choose right now if I want to pick up my phone 
and look at something. Right? I can choose every morning when I wake up, should I pray or should I go back to sleep? Should I pray or should I just watch TV or look at my phone? And you know what happens, you know, when you keep looking at your phone? One hour, easy. Right? They get you. That algorithm will get you because it knows what you like. You want to watch some cops pulling over some people, it'll keep doing that. Right? Whatever you like, it knows. And pretty soon, AI gets smarter, and, you're like, and, and even what you shop for is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to send to you. And when your finger gets tired, they'll make a bigger screen so you can move your arm or your feet. But then, no, they're gonna, it's going to be AI, so you'll be like, next screen. You'll be using verbal commands. Next screen, next screen. You're, you're the slave, all right? You're the slave. And if you sit there watching screen time all day, and I'm not saying the phone and the Internet is bad because you can use it to, as your food, okay? You can use it as your food to conquer your land rather than being a slave to it, and, and you cannot control it. But you use it for your food and, con- and conquer your land, and you can expand your mind and your talents and your ability for God's kingdom. Amen? And, and if you need to learn child behavior or, or if you, some people like psychology, you know, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, psychology can help to some degree. You know, but you're going to have to depend on God still, okay? And psychology can be fun because, you know, we learn it. We like to learn about people's brains and minds. Whether it's your health, body, you can learn how to eat, how to exercise. But at the end of the day, you depend on God, but you have to do your part. Amen? So you have to choose to become the new. And when you become the new, sometimes it hurts. Right? It hurts. Why? Because you're so old and you got to change. You got to meta, whatever that's called, metaphor says, right? You got to change. Okay? You got to change. If you're a person who gets offended, you got to stop getting offended. Otherwise, you're operating in hate, not love. And you got to do everything in your being to get rid of that. You cannot expect God to like, okay, vindicate you and you go out, bring judgment on the person that offended you or, or you think wronged them. That's not going to happen, trust me. It's you that needs a change, okay? You look in the mirror and say, you need a change, okay? Don't, don't tell your spouse to change. Everybody knows they got to change except yourself, all right? You change first. How about that? Be, be, the, be, the, be the example and you change, Instead of keep telling somebody else to change. Amen? All right? So if you want to reign in life, you got to change. Simple. Simple. Not funny? All right. We'll end it there. Thank you, God. Let's give the Lord a hand.